morning i pray that you will speak to our hearts and minister to our spirits thank you father in jesus name we pray do a new thing in our lives set everyone free liberate your people release them from every oppression release them from every oppression let your name be glorified 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 oh lord everyone who has got a need lord meet that need this morning thank you father in jesus name we pray i love you all have your seat something good is coming your way this morning last sunday by the grace of god we we continued our teaching on the power of self-knowledge and then we looked at uh, the need for us to recognize our dominant weakness. Everyone has got a weakness, we said. We looked at 18 facts that you should know about your weakness. We said that everyone has a weakness. Two, your heavenly father is fully aware of your personal weakness. Three, your weakness is the entry point for demonic spirits. That means if you get rid of the weakness, the devil will not be able to enter your life. Uh, four, that God will make every effort to reveal your weakness before it destroys you. Five, someone will be assigned by the devil to feed and strengthen your weakness. So you should be careful who you relate with. Number six, your weakness will pursue, embrace, and seize any friendship that permits it, feeds on it, or enjoys it. And number seven, your weakness has an agenda, a plan to take over your life and sabotage it. Nothing else. The agenda is to take over your life and sabotage it. Number eight, your weakness will bond you with wrong people. Like Samson was bonded to Delilah. And he ended up, his eyes were scorched out and he became a prisoner, a slave, grinding the meal for the Philistines. Number nine, your weakness will separate you from right people. Just as it will bond you to right, wrong people, so it will separate you from right people. Your weakness makes you uncomfortable in the presence of those who refuse to justify it. So you discover you'll be running away from the right people and you'll be getting connected and closer and being bonded to the wrong people. And number 10, your weakness can emerge at any time of your life, including your closing years. That means as you're getting older, the sick weakness will start to show forth. In other words, what you fail to master in your early years will master you in your later years. So if you tolerate any weakness, it will wound you. Eleven, your weakness cannot be overcome with human effort, philosophy, explanations, and self-willpower. Only Jesus Christ, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, can help you overcome. And that's why he came. So you need to call on him now and ask him to deliver you and he will set you free in Jesus' name. And number twelve, we said... Your weakness does not necessarily require a personal confession to everybody or anybody. But recognition of it in the presence of God. You, you, it's not a must you must confess your, your weakness. It's not a must you must confess your weakness either to somebody or to everybody. No. The most important thing is to admit it before God. I have got this weakness. Lord, I am sorry for manifesting this kind of character, this kind of attitude. Deliver me. And then number 13, easiest time to destroy your weakness is at its beginning stage, stages. And then we said in number 14 that God will permit you to enjoy many victories even while your weakness is operating within you. So you can still be telling lies and see yourself still progressing. You can be fornicating and still see blessings flowing in your life. That does not mean God is approving what you're doing. That does not mean that judgment day is not coming. But God is just being merciful and gracious. He allows a light to shine upon the good and the bad. So you need to deal with it. Number 15, those you love are waiting, crying, waiting in the shadows for you to overcome and triumph over your weakness. So we saw that our weaknesses affect people. It hurts those who love us. It hurts those who care about us. And they are waiting. And they'll be very happy to celebrate and say, thank you, Jesus, that my husband is free, my wife is free. My son is delivered. My friend is delivered. Number 16, you are only a slave by what you permit. If you permit it, it will enslave you. It will keep you in prison, in bondage. But if you resist it, reject it, it will live your life. And 17, your weakness can only be overcome by the word of God. You need the word, a lot of it inside of you. You need to feed on it, meditate on it, eat it, let it digest, let it 
influence your words, your thoughts, your actions. And then number 18, the last one we looked at is that overcoming your weakness will bring you an incredible reward for eternity. All right. So I just did that to refresh your memory. So in case you were not here last Sunday, uh, you will be aware of the things we discuss. Now I want to quickly wrap it up. Ten wisdom keys to remember concerning your weakness. Ten wisdom keys to remember. Please note it down. It will help you to remember. Ten wisdom keys to remember. Number one, what you fail to destroy will eventually destroy you. Never forget that. From all the things we discussed last Sunday, this will summarize it for you. This will help you to remember. Ten wisdom keys to remember. One, what you fail to destroy will eventually destroy you. If you refuse to destroy the anger, the bitterness, the hate, it will ruin you. If you refuse to deal with the unforgiveness in your life, if you refuse to deal with the corruption, the immorality, it will destroy you. If you refuse to deal with the weakness of drinking alcohol and getting drunk all the time, it will ruin you. If you refuse to deal with any of the vices, any of the evil characters or habits that you have formed, or that has developed and is manifesting in your life, it will destroy you. Don't ever play games with it. That's the truth. Remember what we said. It has only one agenda. Sabotage your dream. Frustrate your life and destroy you. The devil only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, number two. What you are willing to walk away from determines what God will bring to you. What you are willing to walk away from. What you are willing to walk away from will determine what God will bring to you. You see, there are some relationships that you think you cannot do without. And in that relationship, there is immorality involved. In that relationship, there is a lot of sin committed. Every time you're with the person, you will sin. Every time we're with these people, you know, you forget all you have learned about God. And you see, what you are able to leave behind will determine what God will bring to you. Remember what Jesus said. He said that if you lose your father and your mother and your brother because of me, you will gain more fathers, more brothers, and more family members. So there's always more coming your way. But sometimes you say, no, this person has been good to me. He has not offended me. But you guys are living in fornication. You are not married. He's not even talking about marriage. You are sinning every day. Why don't you deal with it separate from the person? You say, no, if I do, you know, I will be hurting him. What about God that you're hurting? So what you are willing to walk away from will determine what God will bring your way. Oh, he's into fraud and he's making a lot of money. But when you think of living the fraudulent life, this 419, this wire game thing to collect from people what they have labored for, you think of all the money you have made, the millions that have come into your hand in the past, and you're saying, no way. I can't stop this. If I stop, how am I going to feed? How am I going to get money? What job will I do that will give me that kind of money again? The same thing happened with young girls who are always collecting from some big boys, some sugar daddies and all that. You think of all the money and all the gifts that are coming, and you know that you need to deal with this thing and turn away from it, but you are saying, no, if I do that, where will the money come from? Who will buy me dress? Who will buy me food? Who will buy this for me? Who will give me money to do what I need to do? So, I need to continue. What you are willing to walk away from for the sake of salvation, for the sake of Christ, will determine what God will bring your way. And I found out that when you make a great sacrifice for God, you turn from something that looks very difficult, something that looks very important to you, but you have been convicted by the Spirit of God that is a sin in the sight of God, and you turn away from it, good will come your way. God won't let you down. I say God won't let you down. He will not allow you to have an experience that will make you to go back. That's what I'm saying. But first of all, he wants to see your reaction. He wants to see how you respond. He wants to see you turn away from those things first. Number three, all men fall. The great ones get back up. There's nobody who hasn't failed once. All men, except for Jesus. All men fall. All men fall into sin, fall into wrongdoing. We call it mistakes sometimes. All men manifest weaknesses. So, the great ones are the ones who will get back up. They don't stay in it. They say, I'm already in it. Let me just continue. You are in fornication. I'm already in it. Let me just continue. 
Per adventure, you will marry me. You will drop the first baby. Per adventure, you will marry me. You drop the second one. Per adventure, the person who dropped the first one didn't marry you. Drop the second one, didn't marry you. You think it's the third one, he will marry you. Per adventure. You don't continue what you know is wrong. You repent. You tell one lie, you have to tell another one to cover the first lie. And so it continues. It never stops. You've got to come to a point where you say, no, this is evil, this is wrong, and I'm going to stop. So why are they great? They are great because they know how to say enough. They say, no, I must rise. I must not remain where I am. And by God, is so great. If you read Psalm 145, he tells us he knows how to, how to lift up those who have fallen down, those who have bowed down, those who have been beaten to the earth by the devil. God won't walk away. He will lift you up. When, G when Jesus asked Peter to come to him on the water, and Peter was walking by faith, and suddenly he was distracted by the devil, and he started to focus on the wind and the storm, and he began to sink. Jesus didn't walk and leave him. Jesus was still there waiting for him to respond. When he called upon Jesus, help me, what did he do? He reached out to him and pulled him up. God will not leave you, but he will not force you to rise. If you don't ask for help, you won't get help. Amen, somebody? So it's important. Get back up. Turn from what is evil. Don't continue. Oh, he's going to marry me. Let him marry you first. Did you hear what I just said? Some people are looking at me. Number four, stop looking at where you have been and start looking at where you are going. Don't allow your past to hold you back. Don't allow the guilt of what has what happened in the past to hold you back. Leave it behind. Once you have repented, leave it. God has forgiven you and as far as God is concerned, you have no past. Don't let it hold you back. Just keep going. Stop regretting. Yes, as long as you have sincerely from your heart repented, let it go. And there are some also some negative things in the past that may want to stop you. Some experiences you have had, some steps you took that resulted in some negative consequences. I know that each time you think of what your present condition, the challenge you're going through, there is a tendency for you to start regretting and blaming yourself and blaming yourself over and over again. If you continue to do that, you will not come out of that situation. So all you need to do is deal with the guilt. Once you repent and sincerely from your heart, learn the lessons, identify the lessons you can learn from your past experience, then put the past behind and move ahead. So look at where you are going. Always focus on where you are going. If you want to go to heaven, focus on where you are going. Amen? Amen? If you want to make it to the top, focus on where you are going. Number five, you cannot correct what you are unwilling to confront. You cannot correct what you are unwilling to confront. Any evil character that you are not willing to face and confront, you can correct it. You don't want to hurt that person. You don't want to hurt your husband. You don't want to hurt your wife. You don't want to hurt your children, so you allow them to continue to do what is wrong. What you permit stays in your life, and anything you are unwilling to confront, you can't correct. You must face it. Call it what it is and deal with it. If you do not acknowledge that you are in error, you cannot correct the error. So you need to confront it and deal with it. There is no weakness you cannot overcome. Don't forget Jesus has already overcome for you. There's no character you cannot change. The problem is we refuse to acknowledge this is our problem. I've got this. This is wrong. This lifestyle is wrong. This way of talking is wrong. This gossiping thing is wrong. This lying thing is wrong. I must change. I must stop. It's only when you are willing to face it and win over it, that's when you can correct it. Number six, crisis always occurs at the curve of change. Crisis always occur at the curve of change. Every time you make up your mind to change your way of life, you're going to have a battle in your hands. The devil will not let you go. The old man will rise. Huh? He will see things will not be as it used to be. It cannot be that easy. You want to stop lying. There will always be more temptation to lie. You will discover that everything about the old life will rise up wanting you to fail. So, but you must be willing to resist it. You must be willing to confront and win. Confront it and win. 
you must be willing. You must be willing. But I want you to be aware that at the curve of change, there will always be crisis. There will always be crisis at the curve of change. There will always be crisis. That commotion will be there. That trouble will be there. Your friends will kick. Your colleagues will kick. Family will kick. Even your husband, your wife can kick against it. Why are you change? Why are you like this? They will harass you. They will disturb you. They will offer you free drink, free this, free that. You don't want to do any more. People will start chasing you that time more and more. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's normal. It happens. There, that is when you prove that truly you made up your mind. That's why I always tell people the beginning of everything is a decision. Once you have decided, you have decided. You make up your mind, then you put your feet down and resist. And you will win. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. Number seven, anger is the best place for solutions. Anger is the best place place for solutions. The best place for solutions. You need to hate your weakness. Come to the point where you become angry at anger that you are manifesting. Become angry that you seem not to have control over yourself. Become angry that every day daddy is always complaining about this thing I'm doing that is wrong. Mommy is always complaining about this thing that I'm doing that is wrong. My husband is always complaining about this thing that I'm doing. He's always saying this is not good, this is not good. Get angry at yourself. That Look, this evil, you must stop. I'm tired of having problems with people. I'm tired of people looking at me and telling me you must get rid of this thing. This thing, if you are bad, you must go. Until inside of you, you revolt against it, you cannot have change. You can't. That's what I mean by anger as the best place of change. Until you get angry at where you are and how life has been treating you and how things are, you will not take steps to change it. As long as you're comfortable with it, nothing will change. As long as adultery is not evil in your sight, you are comfortable with it, keeping a girlfriend while you have a wife, you won't change it. You can pray about it, but it's not really going to work because you are, not, you are not angry at this evil character. You are not angry that this thing will stop you from going to heaven. Until everything in you rises up against you and says, enough, this thing, you must go. That's when you take a stand and then it will work. Number eight, struggle is a proof you have not been conquered by a weakness. Struggle. The fact that you are still struggling with the temper. Every day you say, I won't do it again. You'll try, you know, but then you fail. And then again, you try, you try. They are provoking you, you manage. You, man you wanted to, but the thing, you know, you hold yourself back. Then one, after some time, you, you let loose. You still come back again, you are trying. The fact that you are making effort means you have not been conquered by the enemy. When you are conquered is when you stop trying. When you throw in the towel and allow defeat, there's no need trying. This is just who I am. They just have to assert me the way I am. That's when you have been defeated by the enemy. But as long as you are making effort to overcome, God will support you. It means you are still alive. It means that you are, you are really interested in winning. And you will truly win in Jesus' name. May the Lord give you grace to overcome every weakness in your life. I say receive grace to overcome every weakness in your life in Jesus' name. Number nine, what you can tolerate, you can cannot change. Anything you can tolerate in your life, you can't change it. Anything you are comfortable with, you can't make any move to stop it. It's not only in people's life, you know, what your children manifest or what your spouse manifests or your friends manifest or your brothers and sisters whom you are close to manifest. No, I'm talking of starting with yourself. Any weakness you can tolerate in your life, you can't change it. Any weakness another person is manifesting that you are comfortable with, you tolerate it, you can't change it. You've got to revolt. Inside you rise up against it and say, no, this must stop. This can continue. This you won't manifest in me. Then only then you can change it. I hate lies and I hate liars. I like faith 
And I don't like people who are always pumping doubt, trying to put doubt or fear into me. So anytime somebody is talking like that, I will immediately, sharply, I will tell the person, please don't. I don't want to tolerate it because I don't need it. So it's very important that you know how to reject what is not right in your own life before you start talking about your immediate family. In order for this evil not to become so, they will not become so used to it and accept it as a norm, as a way of life. Especially when you're raising up children. There are things you should not accept. Once they manifest, tell them, no, not like that. This is not good for you. Show them from the scriptures, this is not right, this is not right, this is what God expects you to do. And then God will work it out. Number 10. Every relationship will feed a weakness or strength. Every relationship that you are involved in will feed a Feed a weakness or strength in you. In other words, any man or woman who comes into your life or whom you have contact with, but the reason of their lifestyle, the words they speak, the things they do and how you will interact, they will either be strengthening a weakness or they are strengthening one strength, one good quality you have. They are either provoking you and standing you up to manifest a good character or they are strengthening you and encouraging you to manifest a bad character. They are either helping you to develop a good habit, a good mental attitude, or they are putting negative things inside you and making you to become a negative person. One way or the other, is either they are encouraging you to love or they are encouraging you to hate. Is either they are encouraging you to speak good about people or they are encouraging you to run them down with your mouth to gossip them. Is someone get what I'm trying to say? Is either they are encouraging you to live holy or they are encouraging you to live in immorality. Is either they are encouraging you to smoke or they are telling you that is not the way. Some way or the other, they will encourage something in you. They will be feeding something. But what are they feeding? Strength or weakness? Only you can answer. So this calls for you to watch the kind of relationships you have. Wrong people will breathe life into your weakness that God is trying to kill. That's why God says, come out from among them. Be ye separate. He said, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers so they don't feed you with the wrong things. They don't strengthen the weakness that I'm trying to get you out of. He told the people of Israel, don't marry unbelievers. Don't marry these idol worshippers. Don't marry these people, these nations, from these nations that I'm driving out so that you can take over their land. Otherwise, they will introduce you to their gods and you will join them to worship idols. You'll be corrupted by them. So relationships affect people. I always teach that friends are influence. I repeat, friends are influence. There's nobody you make friends with who will not influence you, either positively or negatively. So be careful. So reevaluate all your relationships and ask yourself in the evaluation system, you ask yourself, is this person a positive influence or negative influence? This person in my life, what is he strengthening? What is he feeding? Is it a weakness in me or is it a strength in me? By this, you'll be able to put everybody in your life into proper position and know the ones you need to stay close to and the ones you need to distance yourself from. So these 10 wisdom keys will help you to remember our teaching on weakness. So don't forget it. So quickly for today, let's look at recognize your limitations. Recognize your limitations. Recognize your limitations. Every man has got limitations. There are things I am wired to do and things I cannot do. There are things that I'm gifted to do and there are things that I'm not gifted to do. There are things that by education I am trained to do and there are things that I'm not trained to do. That's why the Bible says two are better than one. That's why God put the church together. And the Bible says he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. So he distributed the gifts. And then when it comes to the gifts of the spirit, the Bible told us that... Uh, uh, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the benefit of everybody. To each person is given the manifestation of the spirit for the benefit of everybody. To one is given the gift of word of wisdom, another the word of knowledge, another 
the gift of uh, discerning of spirit, to another the gift of speaking in tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, to another the gift of prophecy. To another, it's just like that. He keeps distributing the gifts. So you don't have it all. That means this message will help you to not to attempt to be who you are not equipped to be. This teaching, if you understand it, will help you to comprehend that there are things you are you are able to do comfortably and succeed. And there are things you will not be able to do successfully too. And it will help you to appreciate people in your life. And seek out the right kind of associations and friendships that will enable you to fulfill your dreams in life. So let it be clear to you, you cannot do everything. You can't. You can only do what you were designed and created by God through your gifts and skills and intelligence. Remember this, goats don't fly. Can goats fly? If you like, throw them up. Trees don't walk. Do trees walk? They are stationary. I'm here to see a dog that can, that can fly. I'm here to see a cow that can fly. Fishes swim in the water, but put them on dry ground. Can they swim? Can they walk? They will only be gasping for breath. And because they are gasping for breath, what will happen? They'll be flapping their wings. He's, ah, he's moving. He's not moving. He's dying. <laughs> he's looking for water. He's dying. After some time, you see, it will just be getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Suddenly, it will stop moving. It's gone. But when it starts moving and you quickly take it, throw it into water, no matter how small the quantity of water is, it will come back. I do not know if that sends a message to you. It shows that you are not equipped to be everything or to do everything. You are not gifted to do everything and to be everything. You have limitations in your life. This will teach you to value people. This will teach you to nurture relationship and keep yourself from mixing with the wrong people. It will also help you to stay humble. So no matter how gifted you are, you will always need somebody. You may see visions. Haven't you noticed that vision, prophets see for themselves, but they will need, some to, need somebody else to come and minister to them. A pastor can teach and preach and minister to people, but he also needs someone else to minister to him. Why did God do it that way? So that you realize that, look, you are not Alpha and Omega. You are limited, and someone is always needed by you. So you can't be everything. You, can do, you can't do everything at a master level. You may try. I try a lot of things. I try a little bit of electricals, I try a little bit of uh, plumbing, I try a little bit of carpentry, I try a little bit of everything. I've got tools for as many things as I can try. But I'm not a master, I know my limitation. The ABC I can handle, but when I know that this one requires a professional, I will take my phone and make a call. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Mm, thank you. So there are nine facts about your personal limitations. Nine facts. Truths, information that I need you to have, that once you have it, it will help you. Number one, quickly. Life was created to be a collection of relationships. Life was created to be a collection of relationships. A collection of relationships. Somebody sees what you can't see. Somebody knows what you don't know. Is it true? Somebody can do what you cannot do. So you need to identify that, look, there are things I cannot do. I don't see everything. I don't know everything. It's a must. I don't see everything, I don't know everything, and I cannot do everything. I can only do some things, maybe one thing or a little more than one thing. 
But there's somebody who cannot do what I can do, so I need him. I can't make dresses, but for your information, I can sew. I learned it by myself, but I don't know how to cut. But I can use the sewing machine. I can use my hand to sew. But if I want to make a dress, I will go to the tailor. So I've got my own tailor. Do you understand what I'm talking about? There are literally two things that I can do. But when I need something done, I go to the one who can do it. That's why I have God. I bat my hair by myself. I can do the easy ones by myself. But when I need some styles, I know that I cannot do it with the mirror. I will need somebody to help me do it. So in life, you can do little, little things, but you must understand you are limited. There are things you are not equipped to do. You can sing a song, but you cannot sing professionally. Is it true? So there are those who can sing. Look at this church, for instance. I can do this one, this one that I'm doing now, talking. But there are those who can play the instrument. There are those who can sing very well. So I leave them to do the job. I need them. So I treat them nicely. I relate to them well because I know that I cannot do what they are doing. Without them, this work cannot move on. Now, I learn a little bit of things and I show my guys in that room there what to do, what to do. And then they master it more than me. Sometimes I'm asking them, I didn't know how to do this one. How did you get to do this one? They will start laughing at me. I'm the one that taught them, but now they know it better than me. They have become professionals because they are doing it every day. So there are things you learn by training. There are things that are inborn that as you express them, you master it and you become skillful in it. So everyone has different gifts, different training, different body of knowledge, different levels of experience, and all of this is to help you become who God wants you to be. But you must recognize you don't know everything. That's why the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. Somebody knows what you don't know. You may know business, good in business, but you don't know everything. You don't see everything. That's why God gave you a wife. God gave you a husband. As I'm walking now, if there is something on my back, you think I can see it? I will not know. Someone will be following me. I'll be wondering, why is this person following me? He will not talk. And then he say, wait, wait, wait. Then he will take it out. Say, this is what's on your back. Say, ah, thank you very much. I didn't see it. How could I see it? I only look at one direction at a time. Why did Jesus send them two by two? Because one person alone will not see it all. One person alone does not know it all. We need people. Why do you have a family? You need people. So life was designed to be what? A collection of relationships. That's why we have a church too. A collection of relationships. You go to school, someone has to teach you. You want to be a medical doctor, someone has to teach you. You have to read a, you have to read a book someone wrote. And then you have to learn with students. You have to you know, you have colleagues, you have, you know, co-students, you have to study together, you have to do uh, paperwork together, do assignments together, and do presentations together. Am I correct, somebody? And then somebody has to mark it. And when you now graduate, you will not work alone. You will still need somebody to work with. Even though you are the owner of the hospital, you will need somebody to clean it. You will need a nurse. You will need a, 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 a medical lab a attendant to do all the tests and everything. You will need you know, a driver to drive the vehicle. You will need a mechanic to fix the vehicle. Is someone getting what I'm trying to say? So in your life, you will always need people. Some of you talk anyhow. Some of you don't care when you hurt people with words. Some of you don't give a damn, but I want you to start giving a damn now. I want you to start being mindful of what you say, how you relate, because you are limited. Somebody say limited. limited. Say it again, limited. limited. Say I am limited. I am not wired to do everything. I am not wired to be everything. So somebody sees what you can't see, somebody knows what you don't know, somebody can do what you don't have the capability to do. So pride will deprive you of the great contributions others desire to give you. Number two, when you fail to recognize your personal limitations, you become blind to the gifts hidden in those around you. When you fail to recognize your personal limitations, you become blind to the gifts 
hidden in those around you. You may not know that the person by your side can do much more. You may not know what he contains, what he carries. You don't know his capability. But Praise God. But when you recognize that, oh, I need someone to help me do this because I cannot do it. What happens is that you now start looking. You start searching. And where do you always start from? From those around you. Your eyes open because you are now searching for someone who can perform for you. So you say, oh, I need somebody who can do this. Oh, I can do this. You? You mean you can do this? Are you sure? But you don't look it. Okay, let me give you a try. And then by the time you say, ah, I didn't know. Look at, can you imagine? I, what I'm looking for is in my Shokoto. Hello. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? So, but when you think you know it all, you will not know the value of the person around you. Some of you, your wife can do much more, but you don't know. And you don't want to give them a try. Because as far as you're concerned, they are supposed to be wives only. Some of you may not even know what your husband is worth. You see him as a husband. Okay, he's a businessman, but he may be much more than a businessman. There might be some other talents or gifts that you are not aware of that he carries. So, if you don't open up, you will not know what somebody can do. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say it at this juncture. All of us cannot be businessmen. All of us cannot be traders. Some of you have failed in trading because you are not a trader. No matter how you try to trade, let them give you one million today. After one year, you will tell a story. You don't have the gift. Your wife may be the one who has it. Why don't you open the business, let your wife run it? Or my wife, one million, put it in her hand. She will become the master of the house. I won't try it. You see, that's a problem. That's a problem. Check yourself. Check your abilities. Check the gifts and the talents you have. Know what you can do and what you cannot do. If your child is the one who is equipped for it, if your wife is the one who is equipped for it, or your husband is the one who is equipped for it, why don't you go that way? I think one of the major problems we have is we two do not understand the meaning of the word marriage, and the two shall become one. You are not going anywhere. She is not going anywhere. And you are stuck together. And you have the mind that you are going to die together. Am I correct? Till death do us part. So, what's the use? It's our business. She's the manager, but our business. And you who is managing the business will not say it's my business. No. You will not forget that you only gave me money, but I'm the one doing the business. So, don't tell me what to do. Mm. So, these are the problems we have. And these are the things that the human mind will be thinking. And when you are thinking like this, you don't even want to venture into it. But look at it this way. But adventure, God put that gift and connected you to that spouse that you have. So that, that your spouse can do this, which you do not have the capability to do, but you will like to. But you don't have the gift. You don't have the capacity. Your own gifting is in another direction, but you will like to. It is interest. Interest is not the same thing as gifting. You can have interest in something, but you are not gifted to do it. So interest is not enough. If you are interested in being a pastor and you are not qualified by God, anointed by God, gifted by God to be a pastor, you will fail. You will eat the food called frustration. Interest is not enough. So how do you know you are gifted? You try, you fail. You try, you fail. You try, you fail. Then that will tell you you are not gifted. I met somebody. I can't forget that guy. Only that I tried. I'm not able to remember his face. We were talking about this kind of thing. He said, he said look, he said, I can sell anything. Do you know what he means by I can sell anything? Eh? Say, I can sell anything. That means even if you give me a human being to sell, I can sell. In other words, he is telling me he's so good. Everything he touches moves. That's his own testimony. 
that is his own gift. He said, there's no other thing that I know how to do than to sell. It's, it's, it's a gift that God gave me. What others find difficult to sell, give it to him. He will sell it before you open your eyes. So find your own. So when you fail to recognize your personal limitations, you become blind to the gifts hidden in those around you. And one of the things that I'm trusting God for, and God has been helping me, is to identify giftings in people around me. Number three, recognition of your personal limitation will bet an ability to discern opportunities around you. Recognition of your personal limitation, your own personal limitation, will bet an ability to discern opportunities because you'll be looking out for who can fit into this? Who can help me do this? Who has got the ability to do this? How do I solve this problem? I can't do this, but how can I find someone who can help me do this? So because you are seeking you, the ability to recognize, the grace to recognize is awakened, stepped up within you, and you'll be able to see opportunities. Number four, recognition of your personal limitations will release compassion towards you. When you begin to recognize, I can't do this. I am limited. I don't have the ability. Somehow, God begins to show you mercy. The compassion of God is moved. It's stirred. So God will stir people to have come to help you, to come to your aid because you have seen your inadequacy. That you are looking for somebody to fill in the gap to perform what you are not equipped to perform. Now you are humble enough to recognize, I don't have it. I can't do it. I need someone to do it. Then God will step people. They will show compassion towards you. They will come to help. Ah, pastor, I can't pay somebody to do it. You never can tell. God will bring somebody who may not collect anything. You never can tell. God will bring somebody who will collect so little. You say, ah, ah. When you tell somebody, I did this thing for so so much, you say, How? How did it happen? That's compassion. First of all, you must ag admit your inadequacies. Then God will move on your behalf. Five, recognition of your personal limitations will expose unnecessary goals and inappropriate dreams you have collected within you. Sometimes we dream dreams that are not correct. It's not every dream that we fulfill. It's not every goal that you have that will be accomplished. It's not every agenda you have set for yourself that will receive the backing of heaven. God has a plan. He has a purpose for you and he will always move you towards your purpose. Do you understand me? So when you begin to recognize your personal limitations, it will start to help you to realize that it will start exposing all your necessary goals, all the inappropriate dreams, what we call ambitions that we have that are not necessary. Things you have developed within you that will take you nowhere, but only bring you to a point of frustration in life. I like people who identify their gift on time and they face it. Let your dream be in line with your gifting, your purpose. What you have identified that God has put in your heart to do and you can see that the gift is there to accomplish it. Number six, recognition of your personal limitations helps you to maintain focus on what you are created to do. When you recognize you are not called to be an engineer, why do you waste your time dreaming and thinking and working towards that? So what do you do? It helps you to stay focused. I like Apostle Paul said, this one thing I do. Not two things. Not three things. One thing. One thing. He identified it he focuses on it. When he gets accomplished, then he moves on to the next thing that God will put in his heart. 
Do not attempt to become what you are not. You see, the, that's why we have always told you that broken focus is the reason for failure. When you see that somebody plays football and is making one million naira every day from football, in a week he gets 10 million, I don't know how they calculate it, 10 million naira equivalent. Ah, it's not football. Your football has not been able to take you to, to local government level. But you want to play international because you are looking at the money somebody is earning. Many people have wasted their time. They made their family sell property to send them abroad. 20 years ago, they still haven't played for one club. I met one young man. He said he wants to go to Europe to play football. He was in Thailand. From Thailand, he moved over to Malaysia. He's a footballer. And this guy can sell. I said, why don't you focus on this business you are doing? Forget this football thing. That's not the area God wants you to focus on. You will make it. The guy wouldn't listen to me. He kept on football. Till today, he's not playing football. What is giving him food? Business. Simple. You look at other people, you get distracted. But you know you're gifting. This thing you don't struggle to do. Anything you put your hand to, it works. There's an area where God has gifted you. Know your limitation. Don't focus on what is happening in that man's life. Don't be distracted. He's making it, he's making it. He may be making it, but is that what God wants for you? Until you find your own, you won't get heavenly backing. There are, there are many all over the world. Football, football, football. No club yet. You will die waiting for club. Wasting away. Look at all that things that God has given you. Build it. The man of God has prophesied. We are prophesied. You will go abroad. Amen. Passport, take it. Bah. That they bless your passport does not mean you are going to go abroad to go and work. It could be to go on holiday. It could be to go to school. Hey, look, someone, is someone hearing me? So to go on holiday means you will make your money here. It could be a business opportunity that will just come up. Maybe some, trans some connections online and then somebody says, okay, come over. I'll buy your ticket. Let's talk this business. Some people are overseas, but you're better than them. Forget those things you see. Oh, they borrow car and come down. Borrow money. When they finish, they will sell the car before they go by because they need to pay the person the money. Then you think uh, because he's wearing t-shirt and wearing a jeans that they cut up. Is he open this thing? You think he, he's doing like this when he's walking. Then you think he has made it. Some of them are sleeping on the floor. I know because I've been there. I see them. I counsel them. I talk to them. I beg them to come home. Forget that thing. Think it's as easy as you think. Every day you... Each time message comes from home, you need to see how they used to get angry. Get frustrated. To see hundred dollars to send, think it's easy. Somebody who is managing to eat once a day, you are telling him to send you money. And you are here eating three times a day, even four times, five times. You think, you think they are better than you? It's not everybody, it's not everybody. Most people are struggling, most people are suffering. Some are sleeping in the church. I've been there, even in Brazil, I go to their churches. They sleep inside the church and you think they are making money. Leave that in. Face your life. Tell your neighbor, face your life. God bless you. Number seven. Recognition of your personal limitations removes stress. Nothing is more stressful than attempting to Attempting what you do not have the ability to become. Recognition of your limitations removes stress. You see this thing I'm doing? Talking to That's why I'm not, I don't envy any preacher. I will always do my own thing. Hello? Hey, the God who called me will always bring people that I will talk to. Am I correct? 
It takes away stress. Look at me. I'm a man. Easy to talk like a man. Easy to walk like a man. I don't. Even, I've never prayed, Lord, let me walk like a man, behave like a man. It's 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 inborn. It's in me. But when I want to be a woman, it's hard work. The way you put your feet down, the way you walk, how to swing the waist, how to move. Then, praise the Lord. Then, you know, I sit down, I open my leg. Nista, I have to learn to be, every time you are, you, how many of you understand? It's hard work. If I want to treat my hair and clip a vroom, vroom, but that one, you will sit down and you stay like this, turn your hair like this, turn your hair. You'll be there two hours, three hours, from morning till night. Where are you? I'm doing my hair. You see, I haven't finished. They are trying. Hard work. Women are hello. <laughs> Praise God. When I put to myself for serious work, why don't you be like me? I don't shave the thing. Or just do low cut and come be like this and go. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Then after that, <laughs> I notice they're always eating their head. I ask somebody, what is it? It's the thing is itching inside. So they're always slapping their head. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> As if some small, small things are moving inside the head. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, to be like that, for me, is going to be hard work. Because I'm not wired to be a woman. So, the same way, I want you to look at it. Something you are wired to do, you don't stress doing it. So, if you are a business person, you don't stress. If you are a teacher, you don't stress. There are those who didn't go to teaching uh, college, what they call it, teacher training college, or go to university to read a beard, a bachelor in education. But when they start teaching, they teach better than those who went to do beard. Because it's inborn, it's a gift. If they explain something to you, you will understand it better than a person want to teach. He's pursuing something else, but yet there is a gift inside. And if he will yield to it, he will, God will take him to the highest height. Look at yourself. Stop stressing yourself. Focus on your own. You are limited. You are not wired to be everything and to do everything. Amen? Identify that specific thing and God will assist you in Jesus' name. Praise God. Number eight, when you fail to recognize your personal limitations, you can't seek solutions to them. You can't. When you fail to recognize your personal limitations, you cannot seek solutions to them. You can't. May God help you. I said may God help you. And finally... Whatever you do not possess has been stored in others around you. Look out for those who carry what you're looking for. If you're running a business, look out for those who can assist you in your business. You're running a company, look out for those. Look for able men. <laughs> Listen, God wanted to build an ark. He told Moses. And what did God do? God put special gifts, the ability to produce what he wanted in certain people. And he told Moses, these men, he mentioned their names, I have given them the ability to construct this the way I want. When it was time to look for leaders, God said, look for able men, not just men, able men. So the first thing is one who is able. Who has what it takes to do what you are looking for? So when you recognize your limitation, you'll be looking for those who have the gift, who have the ability. Before relationship, first of all, is ability. Before you say, oh, you must be a believer, let the person first of all have ability. Because if you take a believer who doesn't have ability, you will end in quarrel. An offense. Don't choose someone because he's your relative. 
Choose someone because he has got what? The ability. He has the capacity to deliver what you are looking for. You are limited in that area. You can't do it. So if you are going to look for, you look for the best. That's how these men who are making it, make it. They don't run the companies. They look for able men. Able women. People who are qualified, who are gifted, who have the experience, who can do what they want. They put them in charge. Put some checks and balances in this, in the, you know, create a system. And then let them run the company. They only come and see what they are doing. Check their book, they report to him. That's all. So he can have as many as 50 companies. And everything is working out well. Is he the one running them? No. You look for people who can do what you cannot do. So you cannot, you may not even have a degree, but you can employ a PhD to do the job. But for some people, no. If he went to school, he would take my company from me. <laughs> who told you? He will change the papers. He will do this. He will do that. I can't control him. It's not like that. You will not go far if you have that kind of mentality. But if you want to succeed, you look for the best. Those who are wise, look for those who are better than them to do the job. They employ skillful, educated, sound men with ability, with experience, with skill to do the job. So we are all limited. Know your own strength and do yours. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Are you blessed? Rest to your feet, let's pray. So we're going to wrap up our teaching on the power of self-knowledge next Sunday. And so I want to encourage you to come. God will be doing something wonderful in your life. If you are blessed, please talk to God and thank him. Say, Lord, I'm grateful. I'm truly blessed and honored to hear you today and I've learned something. I'm grateful. Thank you. I'm not hearing you. Give him thanks. Say, Lord, I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Shalabada braka tarabadose. Impresuti kalabo shadada bahada. I want you to pray and say, Lord, peradventure you're here. Like I'm, I can see that some people cannot really say, Pastor, this is my gift. This is my calling. This is my purpose. You have not prayed about it. You know what God said in the book of Jeremiah? He said, you shall seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He started by saying, I know the plans that I have for you. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for your welfare. For your progress, for your prosperity. To bring you to an expected end. So there is a destiny, a purpose, a place where God is taking you. And he has got a plan to bring you there. So he said, you will seek me and find Find me when you seek me with all your heart. So it is your duty to ask the Lord. So if you don't know, open your mind and say, Lord, show me your purpose. Show me what you are putting me. What abilities do I have? Help me to recognize it. Ask him in Jesus' name. If you already know yours, I want you to pray that ask God to help you to.